another Encore presentation of Heart to Heart with Anna. Yesterday, we ran an Encore presentation about learning disabilities and possible brain injuries, so it just made sense to follow up with the podcast we did about school issues from Season 2 of Heart to Heart with Anna. The title of today's presentation says it all, School Issues, Bullying, Parent Advocacy, and Making Schools Safe for CHD Survivors, and it features special education advocate Lisa O'Connor, who was also on yesterday's show. Additional guests are CHD survivor Megan Perkowski and Heart Mom Nancy Jensen. There are many considerations that need to be made for our CHD survivors. I hope today's show will give you some ideas about how you can be a strong advocate for yourself or your child when dealing with the educational system. Please enjoy today's Encore presentation. Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna, featuring your host, Anna Jaworski. Our program is a program designed to empower the CHD or congenital heart defect community. Our program may also help families who have children who are chronically ill by bringing information and encouragement to you in order to become an advocate for your community. Now, here is Anna Jaworski. Welcome to the 12th episode of the second season of Heart to Heart with Anna, a show for the congenital heart defect community. Our purpose is to empower members of our community with resources, support, and advocacy information. It's August, and it's time in the United States to think about sending our children back to school. This is a busy, exciting time for most people. For families in the congenital heart defect community, it can also be a time of concern. Will our children be safe in school? How will we communicate with others in the school about our child's heart defect? Will our child be bullied? What can we do as parents to prevent our children from being bullied? According to StopBullying.gov, here are some qualities of children who tend to get bullied. They are perceived as different from their peers, such as being overweight or underweight, wearing glasses or different clothing, being new to a school, or being unable to afford what kids consider cool. They're perceived as weak or unable to defend themselves. They're perceived as depressed, anxious, or have low self-esteem. Many of our children with congenital heart defects are different and look different. They might have been failure to thrive babies, and they might still be thin compared to their peers. Some of our heart children must have oxygen or use a wheelchair, so they appear to be an at-risk population for bullying, which is why our topic today, school issues, bullying, parent advocacy, and making schools safe for CHD survivors is so important. To discuss this topic, our guests today are congenital heart defect survivor Megan Perkowski, heart mom Nancy Jensen, and special education advocate Lisa O'Connor. Megan Perkowski is a 30-year-old woman who was born in January of 1984 with tricuspid atresia, an atrial septal defect, a ventricular septal defect, and pulmonary vein stenosis. Megan has undergone numerous medical procedures, including several cardiac catheterizations and seven heart operations. She is now on permanent supplemental oxygen due to lack of blood flow caused by major scar tissue. Megan attended traditional public schools from the time she was three years old. Megan's mom informed school administrators, teachers, and school nurses of her conditions. It wasn't until middle school that Megan began to experience much bullying. By high school, the bullying had escalated from verbal to physical abuse. Megan withdrew from public high school but finished her degree through her town's adult education program. She graduated in 2002 from high school and in 2008 obtained her registered medical assistant certification. We'll meet Nancy Jensen and Lisa O'Connor later in our show. Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna, Megan. Hello. It sounds like you began your education in the public schools very early, starting at age three. That was quite a while ago, but I'm wondering if you remember much from that time, like if your mom was there with you or if you only went for a couple of hours and did you like school? It was quite a while ago, but my mom did attend with me. I was only there for a couple of hours, maybe two days a week. At that point, they focused mostly on my separation anxiety and being away from my mom, so I started not with your typical education in the school system. As I obviously got older, I was mainstreamed into a traditional public schooling. 
Okay. And it sounds like school went fine for you through the elementary school years, but then it got harder in the middle school years, which is so typical. Can you talk a little bit about what happened when you were in middle school, what children did that were unkind to you, and especially can you tell us some advice for children or parents that we can prevent some abuse in those middle school aged days? In middle school, the students were able to actually see my disability rather than just hear about it. I had a few major operations and had to wear body braces. So I did start looking different. And Mm -hmm. that's when the verbal abuse really kicked in. At that age, it's a really difficult age. You're going through so many different changes in life that kids can just be cruel no matter what the issue is. As to any advice I can give to students, parents, and even administrators and teachers is for more of the adults to listen to the kids, pay attention, help them out because sometimes more often than not, they can't stop what's going on and if they try to, it just gets worse. At least that's what I found. For the students themselves, don't be afraid to ask for help. Go out and find as many friends and other classmates as you can, no matter how much older or younger or they're the same age as you. Someone else is out there having bullying issues as well. So talk to them. See what they're doing to counteract their issues in school. That's good advice. I think that's really good advice, especially for them not to be afraid to ask for help. And they may have to ask more than one person because not everybody is good at really listening to the children. I think that's all good advice. As a former high school teacher, I was not surprised to hear that you also experienced bullying in high school and that it had even escalated. Can you tell us how the bullying changed from middle school to high school? And what, if anything, you could have done to avoid it, knowing what you know now, if you had known that then? Well, in high school was when my pulmonary issues started becoming more prevalent. It wasn't as easy for me to get from my classes to other classes. So I started riding a scooter in school and because the classrooms were so small, I could not park my scooter inside the classroom. I had to park it outside. And therefore, while I was in class, other students would come and steal my scooter and put it in another part of the school and sometimes it would take hours trying to find it, and I would miss classes. At that point, I would, obviously, the teacher of the class that I was currently in when the issue occurred, and my next teacher knew about it. But at that point, they really didn't have to do anything. They didn't have to document anything. There were no laws like there are now for bullying. So they just kind of brushed it off and would send another student to go find my scooter to bring it back to me. Honestly, the only thing we did to avoid it was in the classroom that were big enough, I would park the scooter in it. But otherwise, there wasn't much I really could have done before because all the kids had to do was flip a switch and the scooter would go into neutral and they could push it anywhere. Uh, uh, um, wow. And <laughs> I wondered how they could get it so it didn't require a key. They were able to put it in neutral and move it around. And I guess it, they were quiet enough that you didn't hear them from inside the classroom or they would have been caught. It was pretty much silent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was not a fun time in my life. No, but you also told me that they even pushed you when you were on your scooter and that they would put obstacles in your way. 
Can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. While I was changing classes, the students would either jump in front of me and I didn't have enough time to react and stop, so I would end up running over them. And then they would go to the administration and say that I ran over them, that I was the bad person. They would kick my scooter as I was going by, causing me to either fall over or causing damage to my scooter, like a dent or something. And other times they would just take their hands and shove the back of my scooter so it was almost like they were driving me and I was not capable of steering and moving myself throughout the school. And that was not... No, I imagine it wasn't. I can't understand why they didn't give you a buddy who would go with you and who would tell the bullies, bug off. (laughs) They actually did in the beginning of my junior year, but that is when I decided that I had had enough. And that's about when I uh, withdrew. Oh, my goodness. So you endured almost three years of bullying at the high school level before they finally said, really, I can't believe it took them that long, before they decided to give you a buddy who could go with you and ward off these bullies. And it sounds like it was more than one person, which unfortunately you see that happen in the schools where when it looks like somebody can be victimized, then people who might not even normally bully somebody join in the crowd and they become part of the tormenting group. That's really horrible. I can't believe that. I can't believe no teacher saw this happening and grabbed a hold of the kids that were being mean and sent them to the office. It just... Oh, they just did. Um, nothing happened. So even the it teachers was, would see it happened, but the children were not really disciplined? Correct. Hmm. Well, it's no surprise then, given what you've just said, that you decided enough was enough. Was that an empowering decision? And looking back now, do you think it was the best move for you? Most definitely. The bullying was not the only reason why I withdrew from high school. In our town of Wallingford, Connecticut, there is a standardized test that is required to be completely passed in order to graduate. And they teach to the test. So Mm -hmm. because I was out sick so much, I wasn't given the lessons that I needed to properly take the standardized testing. Therefore, I most likely would not have graduated high school in my town if I continued through the public school system. It was a hard decision for my parents to accept, but I was ready very early on. But we had sat down and talked about it, and they told me I had to wait until I was a certain age, and I believe they said 16 was when I was allowed to. If I was still feeling that way, then I could go ahead with it at which point I did, and that was probably the best decision I think I have made about that. I don't think that me withdrawing kind of told the bullies that they won, in a sense. It was just a way for me to regain my self-esteem. Yeah, absolutely. You said that you got your diploma through an adult education program. So does that mean that you took night classes? They were not night classes. It was almost like a homeschool program where I would go in, I would get a book, and it was a typical textbook that the teacher would say, all right, you have until X date to read these chapters, and when you're done with each chapter, come in and I'll give you the test for that chapter and we'll work you through however many credits you need to finish in order to graduate. Okay, that makes sense. Well, Megan, what's the best advice you have for parents who have a child in school if bullying is occurring? Listen to them. 
Okay. Help them out as much as possible. Know your right as a parent. Know your child's right as a student, not only as a student, but as a patient, because having a CHD, we do fall under different laws than a student with, say, ADD. So get as much knowledge as you can. Don't be a helicopter parent. Let the kids deal with some issues on their own because that's the only way they're going to learn. It might be extremely difficult to watch and not help, but in the end, it's best for this child. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Megan, for coming on the show and sharing with us. Now it's time for a commercial break, but don't leave. Coming up, we have a heart mom of a child with a very complex heart defect. We'll discover how she worked to keep her daughter safe in school when we return to Heart to Heart with Anna. Anna Jaworski has written several books to empower the congenital heart defect or CHD community. These books can be found at Amazon.com or at her website, www.babyheartspress.com. Her bestseller is The Heart of a Mother, an anthology of stories written by women for women in the CHD community. Anna's other books, My Brother Needs an Operation, The Heart of a Father, and Hypoplastic Left Heart Syndrome, a handbook for parents, will help you understand that you are not alone. Visit babyheartspress.com to find out more. Welcome back to our show, Heart to Heart with Anna, a show for the congenital heart defect community. Today we are talking with congenital heart defect survivor Megan Perkowski, heart mom Nancy Jensen, and special education advocate Lisa O'Connor. We just finished talking with Megan about her experience as a child with a congenital heart defect growing up and dealing with bullying in the schools. Now we'll turn our attention to Nancy Jensen. Nancy Jensen and her husband Carl have three heart-healthy sons and Jessica, who was born with Tetralogy of Fallot, pulmonary atresia, severe pulmonary aorta stenosis, non-confluent pulmonary branches, major aorta pulmonary collateral arteries, also known as MAPCASs, and DeGeorge syndrome. Jessica was very blue her whole life because despite five heart surgeries, she never had a complete repair. Jessica became oxygen dependent at about seven years old and needed a motorized wheelchair at age nine because walking became too difficult for her. Jessica had two strokes, which greatly affected her development, but she eventually mostly recovered from the strokes, surprising all of the specialists. Jessica started school at three years of age and graduated from high school in 2008. Sadly, Jessica passed away on October 4, 2010. Although she wasn't expected to survive childhood due to the severity of her congenital heart defects, she amazed everyone by being a happy, loving person who survived to be 22 years old despite all of her medical issues. We'll meet Lisa O'Connor in our next segment. Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna, Nancy. Anna, it's good to talk to you finally. Oh, well, it is good to talk to you, too. We've quote-unquote talked online for years now, and so it's nice for me to finally hear your voice. You, too. You, too, definitely. Well, Jessica had a lot of complicated heart defects, and being blue all of the time must have been so worrisome. Jessica was able to start school in the early childhood program at age three. Can you briefly tell us how you helped Jessica's school, the teachers, the nurses, and administrators prepare for having a child with such a complicated medical history like Jessica's? Well, every year I would meet with the teachers and nurses and everyone to make sure that they were aware of all of her health issues. So before school actually started, I would take her with me and we'd go in and meet them and make sure that that classroom and those teachers and the school was a good fit for her. I would make sure that the medical supply company delivered and set up the oxygen supply a week before school started, and I would go in and take the teachers, the nurses, anyone that would be around her that would need to know how to run the regulator on the oxygen tank or the oxygen concentrator and the humidifier and just everything that she would need. Once she was in the classroom, she could get out of the wheelchair and walk around for very short distances. But I would also put her fingers on top of my hand and show them what her normal looked like because her fingertips were very dusky looking. And I would say if she looks worse than this or she's getting a shorter breath, she needs to sit down 
and relax, and she would not regulate herself because she loved school and she wanted to just be a part of everything all the kids were doing, and she'd get excited and basically forget that she had yeah. heart defects and would get up and try to quickly go across the room, and she would end up getting short of breath. So the teachers and everyone needed to be very aware of all of these issues that she had. Right, right. I know exactly what you mean since I have a son who has a congenital heart defect too. When they're very, very little, they can be pretty good at self-regulating. But you're right. Once they get a little bit older, they get so into whatever it is they're doing, they sometimes forget. And they think they can keep you up know, with the other kids. Jessica never did self-regulate, ever. One time I caught her running across the room and she was so blue and put on the pulse ox and she was, 33%, and she oh was about goodness. to pass out. And so she never, ever did. So I would have to make her mm-hmm. squat when she got excessively blue. So I think she must have heard a million times, not only from me and my husband, but her brothers, Jessica, you're blue, sit down. <laughs> you need to sit down now. <laughs> and she had the George and the stroke. And she never surpassed the level of like a seven to eight year old. So even as she got older, she became more and more delayed. And she was in special ed self-contained program so that they had a smaller classroom, more aid. They were able to provide her with a safer, more secure environment where in a regular classroom, she wouldn't have been able to have someone kind of keeping an eye on her as well. Plus, she was, like I said, developmentally delayed enough that she really didn't fit in in the regular classrooms. It sounds like you did such a good job, though, Nancy, of making sure that the school was a good fit for her. And you and I talked a little bit about the importance of addressing the emotional needs of our children as well as the physical needs. Can you talk a little bit about what you did to make sure that Jessica's emotional needs were also met? Sure. Jessica was just very tenderhearted and very sensitive to everyone. And she suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, and as Megan had mentioned, she had separation anxiety. And having been through all the procedures and surgeries and hospitalizations and so on, she just was very insecure. And it was really important to me that she'd be able to feel safe and to be happy. We knew from the time that she was very young that she was not going to survive her congenital heart defect. And so having her get the education so that she could eventually have a job and become an adult in society and be on her own, that was never the primary concern for us. The primary concern was quality of life. So I would also, when I spoke to the teachers and nurses and everyone, I talked to them about her emotional needs and how important it was. And we were so fortunate that there was only one time that I had to change schools because it was not a proper fit and I had to fight for that. Usually we had really compassionate special ed teachers and aides who went out of their way to help her. For instance, if one of the other special needs child had a meltdown, one teacher, whoever was closest, would rush to the aid of that student, and there was a teacher's aid that was assigned to Jessica, and she would get Jessica out of the room and away from the situation and make sure that she was okay as well. Oh, wow, that's great. That's very sensitive, and that's very sweet. I'm happy to hear that Jessica was able to have that kind of support. That's tremendous. I have one more question for you. Can you briefly tell us what precipitated you and Carl placing a do not resuscitate or DNR order on Jessica and how the school reacted to that request? Well, as I said before, we knew that she was not going to survive her CHDs from the time she was very young. And unfortunately, her very last surgery, Jessica woke up before they were able to extubate and take the breathing tube out. And so she was just very traumatized from that. She was only seven years old, and constantly she would be saying, I don't want that tube in my throat, I want that tube in my throat. I mean, daily, even months after 
she was home from the hospital. So I thought, I need to be her advocate. And so we contacted her primary care physician, pediatrician, the pediatric cardiologist, and since there was nothing that could help her on the horizon, they agreed because her heart was enlarged and she was on oxygen. It would do a lot more harm than good to do CPR. So we got the DNR orders, and when I took it to the school, they said, absolutely not. Our policy is, is we do not honor DNR orders, and I was pretty shocked. So a nurse that I was working with was just amazing, and she helped me work for, oh, it took almost two years to get the school, to not just the school, the school district to change their policy on DNR orders. And the school nurse helped me find a loophole in the written policy stating something about having an emergency plan to honor the DNR orders. So we put our heads together and we came up with an emergency plan. For example, if Jessica were to pass out or suddenly stop breathing, first thing was to make sure she was laying down. Another thing was the other aides and teachers would take the other students away from the situation so that they wouldn't be traumatized. Someone was to be with Jessica at all times. During that time, they were to call me before the ambulance. They were to have the DNR orders present before they got there. And the school board fought tooth and nail. They were afraid. But finally, we came up with a, an emergency plan that they could accept. And I finally got to talk to their lawyer, and we changed the, the school policy. And going through all that, I realized that an emergency plan really was a good idea, even if she didn't have DNR orders. That way, if the worst-case scenario happened, everyone would be prepared. And I felt more secure in sending her to school. We also had an emergency plan for the school bus ride, even though the last school she was in was a five-minute drive. They needed to know what they could and could not do for her. So it turned out to be a positive thing. And I've actually since then met a couple of parents here in town who have thanked me for going through that for them so that their child would be able to go to school and enjoy being in school like Jessica did without having the fear that their wishes were not going to be honored. Right, right. Well, that sounds like... That was almost groundbreaking what you came up with, and it certainly was empowering, even though it probably didn't feel like that at the time. It probably felt extremely frustrating and like a huge struggle, but in the end, wow. Yeah, it was, and after I met with the lawyer, and then I spoke to the nurse who really was wonderful helping me through this all, she said, Nancy, you won. And I thought, what did I win? I, you know, I didn't feel good. I thought I won the right for my child to die at school. Yay me. Uh, but but that's after not what you won. You won the no, right that for is her, not what her wishes to be fulfilled. Absolutely. You, wow. I mean, you were just such a powerful advocate for Jessica, and that must have made her oh, feel so you. good that she didn't give up. When the going got rough, you just hung in there. And I think that's... I think that's really quite beautiful that you trusted your daughter, you trusted yourself that if you just kept working at it, it would all work out, and and eventually it did. And although Jessica didn't necessarily profit from it herself as far as, thank goodness, the emergency plan never had to be put into action, you paved the way for other parents. And who knows whose children you've helped along the way with being such a strong advocate. Well, thank you. It. It was difficult, but I got my strength by looking at my beautiful daughter, who everybody loved, and I was Mm -hmm. so grateful for the other players that helped, the teachers, the nurse, all the nurses, and just everyone. They provided her with a wonderful place to go to learn, and she opened up, and she had friends, and she was a lot more what you would consider normal, and seemed that everyone wanted to protect her 
because she was just so innocent and it's wonderful. It's a beautiful thing when the teachers in the schools will help the children. And our school, having several special ed classes, they, at the time, seemed to be a lot more accepting for these special needs kids. And I'm really grateful for that. Well, that's a positive place for us to stop because it is time for a commercial. But thank you so much, Nancy, for sharing some wonderful advice for how parents can stand up and be an advocate for their children and how they can put together that emergency plan. We'll be hearing more about that from Lisa O'Connor when we come back to Heart to Heart with Anna. Anna Jaworski has spoken around the world at congenital heart defect events, and she is available as a keynote or guest speaker for your event. Go to hearttoheartwithanna.com to learn more about booking Anna for your event. You can also find out more about the radio program. Keep up to date with CHD resources and information about advocacy groups, as well as read Anna's weekly blog. Anna wants you to stay well-connected and participate in the CHD community. Visit hearttoheartwithanna.com today. Welcome back to our show, Heart to Heart with Anna, a show for the congenital heart defect community. Today we are talking with congenital heart defect survivor Megan Perkowski, heart mom Nancy Jensen, and special education advocate Lisa O'Connor. We just finished talking with Megan about her experience as a child with a congenital heart defect growing up and dealing with bullying in schools. And we talked with Nancy about being a mom to a child with a CHD and how she worked with the schools to keep Jessica safe. Now we will turn our attention to Lisa O'Connor. Lisa O'Connor is a special education advocate representing both children and their parents as they navigate through special education. She lives in the greater Boston area and received her training through the Federation for Children with Special Needs. She is also a court-appointed special education surrogate parent representing children that are in state custody overseeing their education. Through her experiences, she has met many families of children with congenital heart defects, guidance, and education due to developmental delays, learning disabilities, and their needs for accommodations. She has found rewarding pathways that enable these warriors to fully access the school environment safely. She is well-versed in special education law, individualized education plans, also known as IEPs, accommodations, the 504 plan, and individual health care plans, which are IHCP or EAPs. All of these students are entitled to all of these programs. Every child is unique, as are their heart defects. Through her advocacy, she aims to share her knowledge and experience with the heart defect community for the benefit of children with CHDs. She can be found on Facebook at Special Education Collaborative Consulting. Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna, Lisa. Thank you, Anna, for inviting me to share my knowledge with the families. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, it's always great to talk to you and some of my listeners. We remember that you were actually on the last episode of Season 1. Yes, I was. It was very enjoyable. Yes. Well, I'm so happy to have you back on the show. As a special education advocate, Lisa, you have a lot of experience helping families put together IEPs and accommodations or 504 plans and individual health care plans. Can you please tell us about another plan that is so important that Nancy told us about in her segment, the emergency action plans? Okay. It was very enjoyable listening to Megan and Nancy talk, the very, very strong women. Nancy mentioned the emergency action plans, and these are very different documents from the individual health care plans. Emergency action plans are documents developed typically by school nurses and the parents, and it's created to educate school personnel on the child's unique medical needs. And while individual health care plans are much more detailed and kept in the school nurse's records because they're private documents, Emergency action plans are not as detailed and are to be shared with the school personnel that work directly or indirectly with the child. Emergency action plans are very clear documents, and they are made to let school staff know what signs to look for when a child is in a medical situation, and it also informs school staff of the protocol to handle such an emergency. It is important to both emergency action plans and individual health care plans to be updated before the start of every school year and if there are any changes in the child's medical condition during the school year. And as Nancy pointed out, she would met with the school nurse and her daughter's teachers before the school year, so everybody was quite clear on what needed to happen. It is also very important that new photos of the child be included in the upper right-hand corner of these documents so the child can easily be identified by school staff 
And keep in mind that it's a good idea to use a photo of what the child typically looks like on a typical school day and not a photo that might be, have been specially taken for school picture day. For example, mm-hmm. if a child wears glasses every day in school, then they need to have their glasses on in this photo as well. And mm-hmm. it's important to remember that copies of these documents will be made and handed out to school personnel. When copies of the photos are made, the Copied photos tend to not be as clear as the original photo, and it's very important that all photos of the child be recognizable as they are used to quickly identify the child in an emergency. School personnel change every year, and there are hundreds of students for staff to remember. Plus, there's also substitute teachers that come in on a daily basis that are not familiar with the child. Some emergency action plans and some children have perhaps defects or disabilities that are not easily recognizable. They're more invisible to the naked eye, so it's a good idea to have photos of the children. And emergency action plans are a private document, and they need to be marked as confidential. And while they are shared with everybody who has a copy of it, it's also very important to remember that HIPAA, which is private medical, is also very important in the schools as well. Emergency action plans should be kept in private places and not posted on classroom walls. We need to protect the child's privacy at all times. And schools typically have special folders marked confidential for when teachers and school nurses are absent and substitute staff is called in. Again, this is why having an updated photo of your child is so very important. Well, emergency health care plans are kept in the nurse's office. Emergency action plans need to be shared with all school personnel to come in contact with the child. And I think it's always a good role of thumb to have parents go in and speak to the school nurse and collaborate as to school personnel that are going to be working with the child, and collaboration is key to success. While schools may find it easier if a parent provides the school nurse a list of the known school personnel, because many times the school nurse does not know who's going to be working with the child every day. And this is especially true if a child is on an IEP and is pulled out of class to work with very specialists. In many instances, school nurses are not aware of children that are on IEPs, So the school nurse might be more apt to share emergency action plan with maybe the phys ed teacher or the art teacher or the music teacher. They wouldn't know that it also needs to be shared with an occupational therapist, physical therapist, and the like. So my rule of thumb is, and I tell families, that it's a good idea to just provide the school with a list of school personnel and the people that I think should probably be on it. The rule of thumb is the principal, the vice principal, the school nurse, the core curriculum teachers, special education teachers if the child works with them, paraprofessionals, classroom aides, lunch aides, recess aides, phys ed teachers, music, art, and technology teachers, librarians, school psychologists and guidance counselors, physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists, behavior therapists, foreign language teachers as the children become middle schoolers and high schoolers, and most importantly, bus drivers if children do take the bus to school. So basically everyone. <laughs> Everyone, yes. <laughs> Maybe not the custodians, okay. but you might want to include them too. <laughs> well, I know because you never know if your child is going to be walking through the halls, especially if they're given on their IEP the permission to go and leave a little bit early because it takes them longer to get to class and there just happens to only be a janitor in a hallway and they fall down. Yeah, really it seems like just about everybody needs to know. Now you said something interesting that conflicts with something I've heard other parents talk about and that is I've heard other parents talk about putting this action plan actually on a bulletin board in the classroom. It has a child's picture and it says emergency action plan and everything but according to HIPAA what you're telling us is that that's not appropriate. I guess it depends on the family when it comes down to it and how they feel about their child's medical privacy because there are many times that parents go and volunteer in classrooms as well or there's school events, there's open houses and things, and maybe parents don't want that medical information out there for the whole world to see. It's maybe like on an as-needed-to-know basis. Right, but I can see, too, where a parent might want it easily available instead of possibly in a folder in a desk because if something were to happen, you have to react so quickly that you might not think to go back into that folder. And if it's on a bulletin board, it's right there. You can grab it or an aide could grab it and make sure you're going through things the way that you need to. I can well, see both I, ways where yeah. you would want it's, your it's privacy. Both, it's both ways. You know, it depends Yeah. You know, on the medical conditions. The child might have anaphylaxis to peanuts type of thing. You know, I mean, there's all different. child might have seizures. Right. There's all different protocols that this would be used on, and it just depends on 
what the parents feel is appropriate because it is their child. Which is why what you said at the beginning is so perfect. It's collaboration. It's about the parent talking to the nurse, talking to the teachers. And I think it's about also what the student wants, which Nancy addressed so beautifully. And even Megan talked about how she knew she wanted to rise out of high school. She didn't want to stay there anymore. And her parents honored that and gave her the opportunity to make that decision. I think right. I think we need to include the students in the desire to give out information or how they want to be treated. So I really like the way you talked about that and all the different people (laughs) who need to be involved because it's pretty much just about everyone. So, Lisa, what are some things that parents need to keep in mind when helping the schools come up with an appropriate individual health care plan for their heart children? Individual health care plans typically developed by the child's doctor, the school nurse, and the parents. And health care plans are typically more private and kept in the nurse's office. They usually contain much more in-depth detail as to the child's medical history as well as the child's current medical diagnosis, and they may contain medications that the child takes, allergies, and it would also have emergency telephone numbers and emergency contacts. It's very similar to an emergency plan, but Mm -hmm. the individual health care plan has much more like medical history on it and things like that that wouldn't necessarily be needed on an emergency plan. There's a good rule of thumb to try to keep these documents one page in length. Sometimes you're going to have to go over, but sometimes stable pages can become detached and misplaced, so that's not a good thing. And as I've previously mentioned, both of these documents need to be ready to go before the start of every school year, and if the child's medical needs change throughout the school year, they need to be updated, and they need to be very clear and concise to protect the child with medical needs so that all school personnel understand the child's needs in the event of an emergency or to even prevent an emergency from occurring. And while the start of the school year is a very busy time for school personnel and for parents as well as students, it's a good idea for parents to request a short meeting with the school nurse and the teachers to go over the child's medical needs and requesting a meeting with the school and having the school nurse present. It's a great time to answer any questions that anybody might have. Every child is different, and no one knows the child better than the parent does. And again, Mm -hmm. collaboration with your child's school is very important for the success of the child. And if the child is on an IEP, the emergency action plan should be attached to the IEP. An IEP, again, is an individual educational plan. Mm -hmm. Because essentially, the emergency action plan is a plan, just like any other kind of plan, that is essentially a list of accommodations for the child to be able to access the school curriculum. So if a child is on an IEP, the emergency action plan, which is essentially accommodations, does need to be attached and referred to within the IEP. Everybody, even the special education staff, is well aware of what the child's needs are. Right, right. Well, as we heard from Megan, bullying is something that does occur frequently in the schools. Can you tell us how parents can help their children's schools develop safety plans to prevent bullying of our children with heart defects? I think before discussing the safety plans, I just want to go over what the definition of bullying is. So it's very important that people understand that bullying is the repeated use of one or more persons of written, verbal, or electronic expression or physical act or gesture directed to a victim that causes physical or emotional harm to the victim or damages to the victim's property. Bullying creates a hostile environment for a victim and infringes on the right of a victim. Bullying also includes cyberbullying. And again, bullying is a repeated action. So if it's a one-time action, that's considered harassment. So I'm not aware if there are currently any federal laws that directly address bullying within schools. I know that many states have adopted state laws, but I'm not aware of any federal laws at this point in time. In some cases, bullying does overlap with discriminatory harassment, which is covered under the federal civil rights laws, which are enforced by the United States Department of Education and the United States Department of Justice. But no matter what label is used, whether it be bullying, hazing, teasing, schools are obligated to address misconduct that is severe, pervasive, or persistent, creating a hostile environment at school, which is so serious that it interferes with or limits a student's ability to participate in or benefit from the services, activities, or opportunities offered by a school. So many schools 
have bullying prevention and intervention plans as well as policies in place. And these documents are typically found in student handbooks or on school websites. And if a parent cannot find them, they should request them from the school to read what the policies and plans are. And when a student is harassed or bullied, it is very important that the school plans and policies be referred to at all times. So schools really, if the schools already have a plan set up, it needs to be fully implemented as written. And when a student reports being harassed or bullied, there must be clear documentation protocol that's in place as schools must then start an investigation into these reports. If schools do not have bullying prevention plans in place, parents can form a group and go to the school administration requesting to work together to develop such plans for the betterment of the school. Eventually, such plans would go before school boards for approval. In extreme bullying situations, sometimes safety plans need to be developed to protect the victim from further harassment or bullying. It really depends on the individual situation on a case-by-case basis. Parents would request a meeting with their child's school to put a safety plan into place. School plans are developed by school administration and parents to protect the child from bullying. Every child has a right to access school curriculum in a safe environment, and unfortunately, sometimes a safety plan is needed in order for this to occur. So Mm -hmm. safety plans are put into place to protect the victim of bullying, and essentially what they are is shadowing of the student by either staff or other students so that the child is never alone in the hot spots Mm -hmm. of the school. So the hot spots are such places as hallways when kids are changing classes, before and after school, lunch, recess time, playground, or even on the school bus. And safety plans should also include school-sponsored events as well, so that might be school dances. Mm -hmm. So all public schools offer students or I should say all public schools should be offering students an anti-bullying curriculum, but I'm sure not all schools do that. And this would be offered much in the same way as English and math curriculum is offered. And just as a child with special needs may need a 504 or an IEP to access the school's core curriculum, the anti-bullying curriculum should also be included in a child that's on an IEP. And some children have a hard time even identifying when they are bullied or even how to handle Mm -hmm. being bullied. And right. usually a school psychologist or a guidance counselor will work with the child so that they can be taught of what to do if these situations should arise. And school environments really need to change to be one of zero tolerance. I know that's always big. Um, you always see commercials for it, but it's very important. And schools can even go as far as to hold rallies, or make anti-bullying posters, get the students on board. They can have after-school clubs like peer leadership or other things to promote anti-bullying campaigns. And parents in town should be involved as well because bullying affects all walks of life and needs to be ended. It really does. It absolutely does. Well, thank you so much, Lisa, for sharing so much valuable information with us. We have to take one more quick commercial break, then we'll come back and put all three of you ladies in the studio with me. So come back after this commercial, and we'll hear a little bit more from these wonderful guests. Anna Jaworski has written several books to empower the congenital heart defect, or CHD, community. These books can be found at Amazon.com or at her website, www.babyheartspress.com. Her bestseller is The Heart of a Mother, an anthology of stories written by women for women in the CHD community. Anna's other books, My Brother Needs an Operation, The Heart of a Father, and Hypoplastic Left Heart Syndrome, A handbook for parents will help you understand that you are not alone. Visit babyheartspress.com to find out more. Welcome back to our show, Heart to Heart with Anna, a show for the congenital heart defect community. Today we are talking with congenital heart defect survivor Megan Perkowski, heart mom Nancy Jensen, and special education advocate Lisa O'Connor. We have talked with Megan, Nancy, and Lisa about having a child with a congenital heart defect in school and ways to prevent bullying and ways that parents can be strong advocates for their children and keep them safe in school. So first of all, I want to thank all of my guests, Megan, Nancy, and Lisa, for coming on Heart to Heart with Anna to address such an important issue. I think it's a really difficult issue for a lot of heart families to address because bullying is such a prevalent issue and some schools are better than others at helping parents and children feel safe and working with people who have congenital heart defects. So 
I really do appreciate everything that you ladies shared with us. I'm going to put all of us in the studio now and give everyone a chance for one parting comment. Unfortunately, we only have a few minutes left, but let me start with you, Megan, now that you had a chance to listen to Nancy and Lisa. I don't know if you have a question for them or if you'd like to make a comment. I do know that my mother and, at the time, my grandmother put into place an emergency health care plan and not only worked with the school, but also with our local EMS and fire department so that every fire personnel and first responder knew who I was, knew what my issues were, and knew how to handle anything if it were to ever occur while I was in school. So I think no matter what child's issue is, there should also be that emergency health care plan in effect as well. Okay. Well, thank you, Megan. So your mom and grandmother may have helped pave the way for future generations since you are 30, and they were probably some of the first people to recommend something like that. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Nancy, was there anything that you would like to say in parting? Well, yes. Just like Megan, Jessica would have been 26 right now, so it was quite a few years ago that we were working on this emergency action plan. And I have a question for Lisa. Is there now a standard form for the emergency action plan, or do the parents still need to work with the school and try to come up with ideas of what they need to put in that plan? That's a great question, Nancy. In helping families, I've done some research to see what documents are out there. You know, I've gone on numerous school websites across the United States, and I always see them for anaphylaxis or seizures. Very, very, very rarely have I ever seen them for cardiac. So what I suggest families do is just Google cardiac emergency action plans or even cardiac health care plans. And where every child is so very different, basically can patch together the best plan possible for your child. And with the doctor's approval and the school's approval, it essentially should be good to go. But typically, no, there's no straight-up form out there that I've ever been able to locate. It's basically just piece together whatever you, you can from other forms that happen to be on the Internet and make one for your child if your child requires something like that. Well, thank you. That's good to know. The IEPs that we did at all of Jessica's schools, and it might have been a school district's form. You know, there were forms that we fill it in and we put in the goals under each category. But I think that it would be a really good idea for them to have a standardized emergency action plan for you to fill in. Oh, I agree. Way, yeah. Yeah, and parents will know that that's available to them. Well, um, IEPs are always federal mandated documents where health care plans really are not. It starts yeah. a lot of times with the parents, and it starts with need. And now that we have so many more children, babies, first of all, who are surviving to become school-aged, and then we have so many who are surviving those middle school and high school years, whereas 20 and 30 years ago, most of those children didn't survive that long. So I think we have a new need because we have a growing older population, so Maybe that's something that Absolutely. we parents need to work on. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, Lisa, you get to have the last word, sweetie. Is there anything else that you would like to say before we close the show? I think it's been a fantastic show, and I really hope many, many parents can benefit by it, and even parents that aren't in the heart community. Today's segment was primarily around bullying, and I think it's important that it be stopped, put an end to it. Thank you. You ladies were amazing. That does conclude this episode of Heart to Heart with Anna. Thank you for listening today. Please come back next week on Tuesday at noon Eastern Time for a brand new episode. During the month of February, also known as Heart Month, Heart to Heart with Anna will broadcast a show every day. On Tuesdays, we'll have a brand new show featuring our theme for Season 7, Congenital Heart Defects around the globe. The other days will be encore presentations with a brand new intro. If you'd like to know what shows will be featured, you can check out our website at www.hearttoheartwithanna.com. Please find and like us on Facebook. Check out our Cafe Press Boutique. 
Revenue from the Cafe Press Boutique helps to defray the cost of this radio show. Follow our radio show on Blog Talk Radio and especially on Spreaker. Once we get to 100 followers on Spreaker, we can petition iHeartRadio to carry our show, and then people can listen to Heart to Heart with Anna in their cars. Thanks again for listening. We know that congenital heart defects touch people all over the globe. So remember, my friends, you are not alone. Thank you again for joining us this week. We hope you've been inspired and empowered to become an advocate for the congenital heart defect community. Heart to Heart with Anna, with your host, Anna Jaworski, can be heard every Tuesday at 12 noon Eastern Time. We'll talk again next week.